It has been somehow roughly a year since I began the Dark Origins series, where it was my knowingly vague and unlikely objective to come to some firm conclusions about the origin of the Chaos Gods. And while I will apologise for the length of time to reach this third instalment, I did have my reasons in waiting, one being anticipating some material to come out which actually proved to be a futile waste of time, but that's how it goes. However, it has given me time to really explore things, and that has meant that now this is expanded into what will at least be another fourth episode to follow this. So starting off this series, I thought it was going to be fairly straightforward, but has now spiralled wildly out of control to the point where I'm trying to relate core ideas of overlapping philosophy and quantum mechanics comically for a fictional verse. And this is fine, and I want to say that although yes, there is some heavy stuff in here, there is lore as well. And what has been my experience is that each step down the road of trying to understand this has then branched into ever more tangents. However, I do feel I have further progressed than previously, and I'm feeling pretty good about where I am right now with this. And much of the thinking that I've had to explore has also helped explain other things that are happening within the 40k verse, to do with time or just how things behave. But really today we're going to be talking more about the warp and the time side of things, really the framing of the picture, before we then, in the next episode, get into the really dark origin stuff. Before we dive on in though, I want to answer this question a little better, and that being, why are you trying to understand something that by its own definition is supposedly incomprehensible? Now, I know many of you often tell me, Luton, you have no need to address such questions, and I say thank you and I hear you. But it's very simple actually to answer, and good to get out of the way immediately. The answer I would have thought to be both very obvious and very simple, that I personally, and indeed many people, do just find it extremely enjoyable running through mental exercises to explain things, even fictional things, and yes, jumping through all the rambling hoops necessary to try and understand just what in hell it all means, trying to collect the breadcrumbs left for us in the labyrinthine world of 40k lore. For some, this might be irritating, pointless even. For me, I love it, to a point. But you needn't just take my word for it. We can hear the same sentiment spoken by a legendary figure within the 40k galaxy, a man of both great wisdom and power, who, let's be real, did not always make the perfect choices, but who simply tried to do the best that they could for humanity. A man who would continue to be involved with mankind across millennia, and capable of wielding truly immense psychic power. That's right, I'm talking obviously about glorious Magnus, Primarch of the Thousand Suns, who told us that, and I quote, the art and science of questioning everything is the source of all knowledge, and to abandon that will doom us to slow decay, an imperium of darkness and ignorance, where those who dare to pursue knowledge, whatever the cost to themselves, are regarded with suspicion. That is not the imperium I believe in, that is not the imperium I wish to be a part of. Knowledge is the food of the soul, and no knowledge can be thought of as wrong, so long as each seeker after truth is master of what he learns. Nothing worth knowing can be taught, it must be learned with the blood and sweat of experience. And there are no greater scholars of that ilk than the Thousand Sons. Even as we fight in the forefront of the Emperor's Crusade, we study the things others ignore, questing for knowledge in the places others fear to tread. There are no truths unknown, no secrets too hidden, and no paths too labyrinthine for us to follow, for they lead us upwards to enlightenment. For Magnus and his thousand sons, they had all sought to try and fathom the impossible within the galaxy, and of course, we saw the result, even when the Emperor had forbidden them to study such things as the warp. But they believed that all things could be eventually understood. Does this mean that I will at some point be consumed by chaos? I sometimes feel this has already happened, to be honest. The verse of 40k and all of its continually contradictory information, and yes, unreliable narrators, is entirely the fun of what it is all about, and quite honestly this aspect of it is really something that should be just known from the outset, and maybe I need to talk about that separately because it's part of what 40k is. Plus, this all gave me an opportunity to start off mainly with a quote from Magnus, which seemed highly appropriate. And in the end, isn't that what's important here? The answer is no. So before the Inquisitors enter the hive city of the Luton Necropolis, and I have to order them assassinated, Let's begin. 
Now, I shall apologize right from the start because I realized that I need to begin this by discussing some physics, and I am sorry for that. We will eventually get to the Chaos Gods and the Warp and the Immaterium, and I'll even speak to the War in Heaven. But what I came to realize was that one of the most fundamental issues we have to think about when dealing with the Warp and even how the Imperium operates as well is about time and how time works within the Imperium and the galaxy. The relationship between our material space the Materium, and the Warp, the Immaterium. Even looking to how some factions like the Necron and the Eldar interact and view their entire history, it all comes back to time. Now it would be all too easy to just ignore this, to write it off and say, hey, it's 40k, everything is crazy, so why bother thinking about it further than that? And I wouldn't presume to suggest that that way of approaching 40k is any less valid than me wanting to dive into things more deeply. But for me, 40k or not, this stuff is still greatly interesting. And once I finish this video series, I would doubt that I'm going to return to talking about all this kind of thing. So I feel it's just as well to get it out of the way, as we're already on video 3 in this series, and I feel quite committed to finishing it. So things will get a little heavy as we wade into discussing some elements that touch on classical and quantum mechanics, the philosophical nature of time, and exploring both the different opinions of physicists and philosophers as to how we perceive time. And, you know, just a reminder, I'm not a physicist, but I do my best in trying to understand this stuff. But I hope you'll see how this does tie into many things and is not just a waste of time, but is something that's quite critical to thinking about the 40k verse. If you care about it at all, more than just, haha, big emperor memes, chainsaws, and orcs bashing heads. The fact that you're watching this makes me already hopeful you're after something a little deeper than that. Overall, consider that one thing becomes very important to understand, and I perhaps already hinted at this while discussing Robert Gulliman's frustration on returning to the Imperium, only to find that its chronology was in disarray, the so-called chronostrife. Now this thing I think is suggested at within Dark Imperium and Plague War that Gulliman begins to realize regarding the Imperium's chronological aberrations that resolving this is a nearly hopeless endeavor in the current state, and many systems will ultimately end up having to rely on local observations of time. This in actuality is likely the most sensible way for the Imperium to operate. In fact, as I will hope to explain, it is really the only way for it to be able to truly make any real sense at all. The concept of an established dating system used by the Imperium widely to determine a chronology of specific events is actually so flawed as to be near enough meaningless. In fact, this idea of having a galactic human empire that can react somehow in real time to things happening around the galaxy is also extremely flawed. However, in fairness to the 40k verse, this is actually demonstrated, because unlike most science fiction who choose to just ignore or MacGuffin their way around it, at least with the Imperium, we're sometimes told that, say, fleets of Imperial ships arrive to defend a world only to discover the planet is dead and has actually been for some time. And this illustrates one of the core and fundamental problems facing the Imperium, that they have to use the warp for both communication and to travel around the galaxy. The effects of the warp in terms of space-time, which are then compounded by normal time dilation and special relativity, means that ships could arrive earlier than expected, or, as seems to be more often noted to be the case, actually arrive far later. So does this mean, then, that the Imperium cannot operate in any kind of centralized way? Sort of, but not necessarily. But it does mean that we need to realize things are just not as simplistic compared to how we see things within our time bubble of the so-called present here on Earth. It also means that for the Imperium, having strong localized defenses within systems is critically important. This is why planets of value within the Imperium are usually heavily fortified with tons of Imperial Guard and vast bunker installations, because they have to be. Because if an enemy attacks you, help may not be arriving anytime soon. You see this happen all the time in the Imperium. And you may have to then bunker down and hold the line. This is why within the Imperium, space marines are not located at one central hub or even at core logistical points within systems to be then assigned out to deal with problems. They're scattered in relatively small numbers all across the galaxy. Some do not even have stationary home planets, but patrol the galaxy looking for Imperial systems and worlds requiring assistance. On the face of it, 
This may seem obvious. You might think, well, the galaxy is huge, so of course we know this is why Imperial forces are spread across the entire galaxy. And of course, that is not inaccurate to say. However, it's much more fundamental than that, because it's not just about distance. It's not about three-dimensional space and how fast you can travel from A to B. We exist in a four-dimensional verse. So it's also about time, specifically space-time. This is one of the Imperium's biggest problems, not just in reliably recording it, but also dealing with effects caused by it. And this is only made worse by having to traverse and communicate through the warp constantly. It's a necessity to having any kind of functioning empire for the Imperium. Unfortunately, it creates massive unavoidable problems that are not as explicitly mentioned as they probably should be. But at least they are mentioned at all and not just ignored. And this kind of detail is one of the things that I do love about 40k, that even when something undermines the smooth running of the narrative, they still leave this in. It's not smoothed over. Well, not too often anyway. And this is why I say that for 40k, we can only partially consider real physics being relative to it. Because in the Imperium, they do not, or I should say, one does not simply travel through warp space within the Imperium of man. Generally, when we think of advanced space travel, we imagine a vessel traveling at a very high velocity. For the Imperium though, they also travel through the warp, a realm that is extremely difficult to give any kind of strictly definitive description of. In fact, we cannot even say with clarity how the warp functions to allow space travel, other than it appears to be vaguely reminiscent of theories about how a wormhole functions. This is probably the best analogy we might make, and even then, not particularly good or accurately applicable. The more interesting thing is that we tend to apply our sense of observing time to the Imperium's world, and that's likely because it's what makes sense to us in the first place. Except, of course, for one small problem. That our concept of the present is near meaningless on a galactic scale. Why? Because it only really works within the small bubble that we have imagined for ourselves around our planet, and beyond that, trying to determine what the present is no longer works in any truly definitive sense. And let me describe this another way for you. So our concept of the present is based around our observable world. We see actions and events occur, and this is what we consider to be the present. But how would you define more specifically what the present is? Is it a vague period of time? How long would that be? Do we define it as the speed by which our brains are able to process a conscious thought? Is it smaller, or is it a greater thing than that? Well, one might then well ask, what would you consider to be a benchmark for perception? Is it merely the time for a thought to appear and be verbalized in response to a question? Does it require a mechanical action? Does it require external stimulus? How do we define this? If my opinion of what determines a conscious thought is slightly different than yours, whose idea of present is more correct? How would you choose to try and quantify that? Some of us may process thoughts at a slightly different speed than others, ranging in milliseconds either way. Is one person's present more than correct than another? This might sound absurd and kind of pointless, but if you think about it, the idea of present moment in time is actually extremely vague and in fact very difficult to define. Because as soon as you've thought about it, it's already the past. Studies have been done that explore this idea of present time, where participants were asked to carry out a simple mechanical task like a key press, and then relate this to the position of a clock time they were observing at the same time. Now strangely, most people believed their physical mechanical actions were occurring somewhere like 75 to 100 milliseconds before they felt their actual movement begin. Now our brains appeared to be distorting our perception of reality and time, albeit at a very small scale. And the first thing people want to say is, well, obviously, Surely that difference can then be explained by the time it takes the message to travel from your brain to the muscle. Unfortunately not, because those messages are said to occur within a range of 15 to 25 milliseconds. So there is something else happening there which is not accounting for that. The overall conclusion was that people were basing their judgment of movement on the decision to act itself, and what amounted to a prediction of upcoming movement. So instead of purely observing the mechanical action itself, they were perceiving that that was going to happen. So this raises interesting questions about how we perceive the present within our own time bubble of the world we live in. Even if we ourselves perceive something to be instantaneous, 
actually may not be, which raises the question of if we're even truly capable of being aware of what you might consider to be the present to a very highly accurate degree. How would we choose to measure the present as well? Nanoseconds, milliseconds, seconds? The more we try to consider what the present is, it can become ever more philosophical. But this idea of present being some constant that exists throughout the world, if we're thinking about theories of time, it's really anything but. It's very vague. It's not entirely undefined. One might obviously argue, does it even matter? Do we really need to define the present so specifically because it's just moments in our day? It's arguable if we ever really even think about it because we're all just living our lives. So absolutely, it's not something that's a big problem, certainly not within our limited planetary bubble that we live every day. But once we travel beyond our planet into the galaxy, across all of that space, we're trying to answer questions about then the nature of time and humanity and the Imperium's ability to accurately observe time and just what inhabits the void of warp space. And then things like the observable present actually do become far more important to define. And so this is where we come to the whole point of why thinking about time in 40k for me is so important because instead of thinking of the present as being the front of say, if you can imagine a time wave that is ever moving forward with everything behind it being the past and all ahead being the invisible future, we may be better off to try and think about the present as not being a thing at all, but instead every moment is more like a coordinate in the space-time block of our universe. We only feel this idea of the present because of how we observe things, how we function, how we see things like entropy, causality. It raises the question if the present is actually a thing at all, or is it just an illusion of our conscious mind? Do those who exist in the warp then rise above this? Are they beyond our comprehension in terms of their awareness of such things? Perhaps they do see reality in a broadly comprehensive sense that is far, far beyond our capability. And previous discussions about chronology within the Imperium, even more broadly within the 41st millennium, I've seen people say, well, surely they should be able to set a standardized time to, by means of some, you know, hyper accurate centralized galactic terror clock, which the Imperium would use then as a point of reference. Well, this was actually said to be the case previously to a degree, until Gulliman realized that it was all a sham and things were way off the mark by centuries, if not even longer. So this idea of a central galactic clock feels once again to be the same school of thought by those who feel that the Imperium should be able to just reverse engineer any technology they come across because that's easy, right? Surely. Well, I've talked about reverse engineering before, so I won't drag over that again, but the answer is basically no. The idea, though, of a stable chronology has been long present in past descriptions of the Imperium. We have all these records and accounts. And unfortunately, this does make little sense now beyond serving as a means to administratively comfort our inability to readily understand how time behaves in the galaxy and the universe. So as some have suggested, using an atomic clock, and just in air quotes, being extremely precise, doesn't actually fix anything, and as I will explain shortly. So the idea of a known present date is again something we project in the bubble of our own, and it only works within this limited space of our planet because it is observable. We see the length of a day and a year. And people might say, well, yes, Luton, but surely if they have a clock about their ship and when they return, they can then see how much time has passed. They can calculate the dates and the events that have occurred to enable a true history of the Imperium within those dates and times. The simple answer is that this wouldn't work. In fact, the accuracy of an atomic clock was the very reason as to why physicists were able to demonstrate that recording time and defining present is incredibly problematic not least while you travel in space, and for our purposes of a galactic empire, it heavily undermines the idea of recording, in fact, anything with accuracy. But this is nothing new. In fact, this has been definitively proven and accepted in physics since the early 1970s. I'll explain this fully, but not just yet. So this gets us into some pretty heavy concepts like we considered in part one, like the eternalist view of time and others like the growing or the evolving block view. And certainly not all agree on how things are perceived in regard to this. Some would say that physics needs to take everyday reality into account and that what we consider the present is necessary to separate us from the past, which we presume is set and already exists 
distinctly from the unknown future. But as I've noted, even our concept of present is highly constructed. We use clocks as a means to order our world artificially, constructed devices to bring synchronicity to our lives. And this became a necessary thing within the modernization of human society. Of course, in our ancient past, this was not always the case. It only became a necessity when industrialization required us to know time with accuracy or as accurately as possible anyway. But this doesn't mean we always needed clocks to define a specific present or a proper time. Before we began to synchronize time, we managed well enough, but it was far more localized. Often it was as simple as just knowing the length of an average day from dawn, then came midday, and then sunset. And this is what you based your day on. There was no need for clocks, but calendars probably certainly. However, as soon as we expanded to a world which required logistical coordination, this was no longer practical, which is why we now have region-specific time zones around the world. Because when people with different local times need to communicate, they can express time by the zone or in universal time. So there's no confusion about when things should happen. Yet even this is not fully agreed upon. Some countries add daylight savings to enable them to have more light at different times of the year because of the Earth's axis. So they adjust their clocks to enable this usually by one hour. Then at different points in our calendar year, they move the hour back again. And it even becomes more stupid when we consider that other countries do not do this. But for those that do, they do not necessarily even agree when the clocks should be moved. So hopefully my point, you're beginning to see how our perception of time and this illusion of having some kind of universal synchronized time is really something quite manufactured than being a naturally occurring thing we should always be able to determine. And there are those who would advocate we should remove time zones altogether and that the world should just exist as one singular universal time. But that would require a whole other explanation. It's too much of a tangent. So I guess Google that if you're interested. But the short version is it would probably never happen because it would really screw up people's heads at this point. Except that even that in itself highlights our limitations when it comes to thinking about time. So let's try and bring this back to 40k a bit. Imagine, if you will, that I'm standing on Holy Terror itself, and I have an associate who's travelled to another planet within the vast glory of the Imperium of Mankind. Specific location is unimportant, let's just say Necromunda. How far away is Necromunda relative to Terra? How many light years? Not important, but once you knew, you might wish to ask your associate, what are they doing now in the present? The answer to this, the question itself, is completely meaningless. Because if they were here on Terra right now, well then, you'd be able to observe them, and so you could answer that question of what they were doing now in what you consider to be the present, because they're near to you. Now, if they were several miles away, you'd still be able to see them in what you would define as the present, because you both appear to be sharing that same point in time. If I wave at you, even from several miles away, you can see me waving, and then you can wave back again, because we appear to be sharing that same present time. But the key word is appear. It's in fact an illusion. We only feel this concept of present because the time with which it takes light to reach you is near enough instantaneous. That's why I'm able to wave at someone and even if they're several miles away and they're looking maybe through binoculars or whatever, they can see you and they can wave back and it feels instantaneous, but it's not. We're unable to perceive it, but even at this small distance, you're still seeing your friend waving basically in the past because from the moment they've waved at you, it will have taken a minuscule amount of time to then reach your perception and then be processed in your brain. This happens to us all the time. It's so imperceptible, we don't even consider it. And this is why I should make the highly known statement as well about time passing differently at sea level as opposed to somebody in the mountains. That's a real thing. So returning to our friends standing on Necromunda, we can't look at them and see what's happening instantaneously. We can't have a video feed which hooks up and see what's happening instantly. It would take many years for the light to travel to us on Terra. So even were you to have an extremely powerful telescope and be able to observe them, you'd always be looking into the past. You could never look at or receive information in what we would consider to be the present sphere of time. Our limited sense of present is restricted to things close to us in our planetary time bubble. This is not particularly clear or well-defined, as I've said. But these ill-defined parameters create problems with regards to our perception of time and how we choose to think about it. Now, world-renowned physicist Carlo Rivelli explains that the flow of time is something which emerges from physics, not from the context of an exact description of things as they are. It emerges instead within the context 
of statistics and thermodynamics. What he means, what I believe he's saying here, is that although time does not necessarily follow a straight line for us as an observable flow because of the unavoidable constraints of entropy and causality, it is these principles which are our basis for both memories and our consciousness to be built upon. So to pull things back again to the 40k verse, if you have something such as a demon existing within the warp, it may not see things in this flowing directional way that we do. It can see things in more like a single block verse formation. That is to say, it would not clearly be able to differentiate between the past, the present, the future, but rather they would see them somehow as being all together. This is a very difficult concept for us to try and imagine. Maybe there is no clear way to outline or really visualize this other than to say, we simply know it to not be the realm that we live in. We're limited right now existing within a four dimensional space and our limitations prohibit us from seeing time in another way. So even if you travel to that place, it is incomprehensible. In fact, most of us would even struggle to think of time beyond it being a specifically linear thing that we observe with clocks and calendars. If we remove those planned tracking systems, one might suggest were we then able to consider time as being a thing at all because of our mortality perhaps, but if you were an immortal creature of the warp with no rising, nor setting sun, no sleep, no dreams, no true concept of life and death, nor any sense of things ending or beginning, how would you consider time as being a factor that affected your reality at all? We may presume that an immortal might see a chain of events as being suggestive of there being a direction of things, but how can we even presume to know that's how things work within the Immaterium? For all we know, a demon might encounter events occurring completely out of our perception of linear time, and that even this most basic building block of our reality is not something that exists within the framework of the warp and the demon's reality. But let us return now to our own recording and documenting of time and imperial chronology. If we knew the time on Terra with high accuracy via some advanced clock, and then we carried with us to travel another clock, which was also extremely accurate, well then, we'll always know the time on Terra, right? Just have every ship in the system in the galaxy do the same. Easy. Problem solved. Unfortunately not. And that's not my guesstimation either. It's established science at this point. There are two examples to note, the first being a theoretical one known as the Twin Paradox. Worth noting, not really a paradox in our general understanding of that term. The Twin Paradox is where you have twins at the same starting point, say Terra, one stays at the starting point of A and the other travels off in a rocket into the space and then returns. When the traveling twin returns, less time has passed for them than the person who remained. There are endless examples explaining this on YouTube. What I will say is that from my understanding, it would not be correct to say that this result is singularly due to that person's traveling in their velocity, that is to say the acceleration that causes it. What is important is the space time distance traveled and this will probably become a bit clearer later. But simply put, the person on Terra may have aged 20 years, but the person returning on the ship may only age 15 years. So, if you had a clock with you, it would be seriously off of the mark. This principle could be applied to the Imperium, but made considerably worse by all the warp shenanigans than if you imagine over a millennia, it's no wonder that the dates for things like the Ultima Crusade are so off the mark, and that's kind of what Gulliman realized. And the second example was an actual physical experiment carried out, as I said, 1971. Its concept is akin to these suggestions of having super accurate clocks on Terra to enable everybody to keep track of what was objectively the present time, the right time. Essentially, a means for the Imperium to keep its chronology straight and everything in sync. Unfortunately, this concept is considerably flawed as the experiment illustrated. It's a very simplistic example and it doesn't work. So what did they do? Well, firstly, they didn't just use one atomic clock. They put four atomic clocks on a plane, four on another plane, and four remained here on the Earth itself. And what they did was they took into account its relative position and rotational speed of the planet. They took the first plane and they flew it to the east, flying with the rotation of the Earth, and this would make its total speed that of the Earth plus the plane's speed. And the other plane flying west would subtract the speed of the Earth. So basically, one plane is flying faster than the other relative to space. With an atomic clock, we can measure time very, very accurately, and as some of you guys pointed out. However, accuracy is not the issue when you're traveling away from the planet at extremely high speed or taking into account these other things. 
In the experiment, even though the planes are not moving extremely fast, as would be the case in something like the Twin Paradox, where the idea is somebody taking a journey in space with a vessel moving at very high velocity, even with the planes, they're using these very extremely accurate clocks, so you can still see an effect. So what you'd expect to see in terms of space-time and relativity is the aircraft with the fastest velocity would show a smaller passing of time, comparative with the slower velocity plane traveling against that rotation of the Earth. And then you have the clock on Earth, which should finish somewhere in between. Was the experiment successful in showing this? Yes, it was. It showed this absolutely to be the case by using these extremely accurate atomic clocks. The plane flying with the rotation of the Earth's clock had less time pass than that on the planet and the plane flying against the rotation respectively. And these are very small increments, but this extremely important experiment illustrates most clearly what I wanted you guys to fundamentally understand right from the beginning. Now, I know it's a bit heavy to have started out with all of this kind of thing, but it's really important to realize how our concept of what is the present and now is really kind of illusory. As soon as we start to travel with velocity, our concept of this idea falls apart. Because remembering that with the twin paradox, it's not solely about acceleration, but also the space-time distance traveled. Now, I did think of one additional example here. Previously, I used some examples from movies like The Terminator and Primer. However, if you're having a hard time getting your head around this stuff, then consider that it's even featured in some family films. In the 1986 film Flight of the Navigator, classic movie, I'm sure many of you have seen, but if not, then I guess spoilers, but it has been out for 30 years. The protagonist, 12-year-old boy David Freeman, searches for his brother, falls into a ravine near his home, falls unconscious. When he awakens, he rushes home, only to find there's strangers living there. He's very confused and panicked, and he falls unconscious. They soon reunite him with his parents, except that they are disturbingly now much older. David, it appears, has been actually missing for eight years, yet somehow not aged. It turns out that he's been abducted by a ship piloted by an AI designed by aliens, and it also connects to an alien ship having crashed around the same time being now held by NASA. Now he ends up being called to the ship and they have a mini adventure. But that's not before the guys at NASA figure out there's something very strange happening of course with his time difference and also what's going on in his head. However, what's relevant for us is the time difference and how the movie quite accurately portrays what physics suggests to us through special relativity and the twin paradox. David was taken from Earth when he fell unconscious, and as the ship was traveling in the movie they say beyond the speed of light, but physics believes that to be impossible. But for the purposes of this situation, even if it were just anywhere near the speed of light, the effect would be much the same. So when David returns, everybody else has aged eight years, but he has only experienced a few hours of time difference. But it's a surprisingly heavy topic for a family film in the mid 80s, and how it deals with some fairly heavy concepts to do with time dilation and the bizarre experiences that could occur as a result. We've often seen a lot of movies to do with time travel, and those are usually kind of more out there, a little bit more wacky and crazy. And you can give that more of a pass because it's time travel and we don't really know if that's even possible. It's probably worth a watch, even now. You were traveling beyond the speed of light, and you could have been gone only 4.4 hours, and the rest of us here on Earth would have aged eight years. Well, what does that mean? Time slows down as you approach the speed of light. And whilst this might seem a little bit off topic, the point here is that what we see in the film would be very much what you would experience within the 40k verse. You might leave a world, travel, and then come back only to find that whilst you are still aged say 50, everybody else has aged and maybe even died. This is the curious thing about the 40k galaxy. Often this is why when people talk about how can somebody be a certain age, how can they see so many things. Again, there could be some very curious issues to do with time dilation, where people are moving around ages and what they are able to see at different times and planets progressions and all manner of different things like this in the 40k verse. It's a very complicated thing as well to align in terms of timelines, chronology, whose characters are where at certain times interacting. It's a very, very complicated issue. So with the atomic clocks and the planes, you can't simply say, well, we observe the effect, but one of these must be a more correct present time. Again, that's a meaningless question, a meaningless concept. There is no more correct time. There's no more truer present. All we can really say is what was shown by the three planes, times being out of sync, is that they are relative to each other. Relativity. It means that although different, none of the times are more true than the other, even if they became out of sync as a result of the effects of relativity. 
So this obviously can be kind of a troubling concept and difficult to wrap your head around, not least because I've barely gone into any detail. But it's okay. Thinking about these heavy concepts is not very easy. I should know. I've been looking at it for three weeks and I've got a massive headache from it. But most of the reason for that is because we base our understanding of the world on things that are very simple, very highly observable to us. We see things and we think, yeah, I can see that happening. Makes sense. And this is why people were suggesting taking clocks with you in an Imperial ship to keep track of time. Sounds like it would make sense, but it just doesn't work. Now, an easy example of how we think of things wrongly on a near daily basis, and again, this, this is applicable to the Imperium and the sort of general ignorance of the humanity and the society of the Imperium. So an easy one would be you look at the sky and you see the sun moving across it. Except, of course, we know the sun isn't moving at all. The sun doesn't move across the sky. So phrases like the sun rises in the east and the sun sets in the west doesn't help because it really embeds this incorrect idea. It makes it sound as if the sun is moving. But we know that, of course, it's not. We're just the earth is spinning. And we do this all the time in human culture by doing things using commonalities that muddy reality in our brain. None of these things are usually a big deal, but it shows how we tend to twist reality just because it's easier for us. It's what it suits us. And often it's what we think of as, like I say, just being more correct more true it feels right to us but it's often wrong we do it even subconsciously all the time when we observe things that feel a certain way we observe and we discuss these things in our day-to-day -day lives all the time and i'm sure we've all experienced different feelings of time as well so just this week i've heard many people exclaim that they cannot believe it's december this year has been a blur has it why do people feel this comparative to another year now, obviously, we know that this year has been different, but that's not the point. The point is, no more or less time has actually passed. It's going to be exactly the same as before. And spare me the explanations. It's a rhetorical question. The point is that although nothing has changed in terms of time past, our lives and changes in them make us perceive things differently. This happens equally when someone is just, say, very busy in your day. You're having a hectic day, suddenly, bam it's over. It feels as if it was over in an instant. Whereas if you were sitting there with absolutely nothing to do, we all commonly would note this makes it feel like time drags on and on, moving extremely slowly. But clearly, nothing is actually happening there. It's just this time of the universe. It's not being slowed, localized around us just because of what's happening in our day. But nonetheless, we feel as if time is moving faster or slower based on these false perceptions that we have. The point being, we as humans are fundamentally quite bad just at measuring time with our consciousness by default. So when we consider more deeply the nature of time using physics, it's not simply describing how time works, it's describing how things relate to one another. But we'll come to that later. Remember as well that most examples of the physics we discuss are just thinking about things within the framework of our world. And that is to say, not a fictional world where spaceships are traveling around through hell and other things in this confusing nightmare. So all the stuff that we think about, it should be with a grain of salt. But it's still beneficial to help define these speculative concepts for us, because if you don't, where are you? In the Imperium, they live across all of the galaxy, regions experiencing varying space-time dilation. They have to regularly travel through the warp, which is something akin to continually traveling through wormholes as a general method of transportation, plus all manner of strange influences that humans say or just dismiss within the verse as being totally incomprehensible. We also see Xenos, like the Tyranid, creating devastating artificial gravity wells so they're able to traverse vast distances in space. Demons who would consume the soul of humans to rip through the walls of reality and penetrate our space with the immaterium, and beings like the Necron, who have transcended time itself and who keep humans as trophies inside their pocket dimensions. So, I would suggest it's fair to say that any of the physics stuff, when applied to the galaxy of the Imperium, is likely not much more than a very loose guide, something to tether ourselves to before we drift off into the void of confusion and lose our minds in the horrors of the warp completely. Probably too late for me, but you all have a chance still to retain your sanity. Now, having said all that, we also should not, as I said in the beginning, glibly dismiss it and just say, oh, it's magic. Well, you never even understand, so why even try? Look, we shouldn't expect that we can apply our real-world understandings with any precision to something like the 40k fictional galaxy, nor could we say we'll be able to explain with any definitive conclusions how things are going to behave there. 
but to just ignore all the understandings we have about time, the nature of the universe, seems to be, to me, willfully quite asinine, apathetic at best. People so very often complain about how the Imperium of Man is so unrealistic because they actively ignore science and refuse to even attempt to expand their understanding of things. Things that some would argue are very easily observable scientific principles. Yet simultaneously, we all see people who complain that applying real-world science is then also pointless to 40k. So perhaps we could just say we're all opting for our delusion of choice and you can come aboard and enjoy the journey or not, it's your prerogative. My perspective is that our collective understanding of real-world science is core to how we map out and rationalise things even within a fictional verse because after all, many of our fictional narratives, be they fantasy, science fiction, fantasy, science fiction, have a foundation in reality. There's absolutely nothing wrong and everything to gain from attempting to overlay these concepts and principles upon the darkly abstract ideas 40k. While we're talking about disagreement as well, it's worth noting that many physicists still do not agree on many things. There's a continual debate raging, for example, regarding the theory of time in terms of those who consider an eternalist, a growing, evolving block view, the more commonly dismissed presentist view. There are also some physicists who think that things like causal loops are possible, but others who say absolutely not, but that we just simply don't yet understand the specifics of these things yet. Some would speculate that travelling back in time to kill your grandfather must be impossible, because if it were, then the stability of all things would collapse, and that once an event had been altered, what would stop others travelling to alter other things, kind of like a looper, we'd end up in a collapsing, chaotic, deteriorated state. This is why some physicists suggest that something known as chronology protection conditions must exist. We just haven't been able to define them yet. But the idea would be to prevent such untenable situations from even being possible. This is fairly common as well, that within science, things are suggested as likely existing but that we just haven't reached the ability to fully define them yet. And you can imagine quite a few scenarios where that sounds applicable to 40k, I'm sure. So why can't we just take a clock with us from Terra, even one that is extremely accurate and that the whole galaxy runs on Terra time? Well, because of the four-dimensional world, the four-dimensional galaxy we exist in. Our concept of the present is really an illusory concept that exists only to us within a small bubble. And even then, very poorly defined if definable at all. So it seems apt that we should return to continue on with the most clouded and poorly understood period in the galactic history of 40k. Of course, it's the war in heaven. So much time has passed that it seems hard to remember now, but we pick up the story from the most ancient of times where the Eldar were still in the earliest of days a burgeoning race. The old ones are returning back to anxiously check on their new developing weapons of war. Empowered from their gluttonous orgy of devouring what had been the Necron tier, coupled with their subsequently new army of Necron, the Catan waged war upon the Old Ones in what was we presumed to be the Second War in Heaven. The Catan were now at full power, unleashing forces beyond anything that can be comprehended within the modern days of the Imperium. Across the galaxy spread the ancestors of the living dead, raging a war against the Old Ones that had been the creators and protectors of the infant Eldari. They dominated the galaxy and the Old Ones were totally besieged. Worse, the Catan had discovered an ever-plentiful source of sustenance in the many races that had been crafted and nurtured by the Old Ones across the many millennia since the beginning of time, and these were now like cattle for the insatiable hunger of the Catan. It is even said that amid this orgy of destruction, the Catan turned and fought amongst themselves for their entertainment. Planets were raised, suns extinguished, and entire systems devoured by black holes via the reality-warping powers of the Star Gods. More radical speculations consider that as mortal races became more scarce, the Catan again turned on one another, but this time in earnest, until only a few of their kind remained. How true is any of this? Unknown. The Catan seemingly preoccupied with their galactic war of destruction against everything and even themselves, 
were not paying attention to the old ones as was meant to have been their bargaining rationale to the Silent King. This enabled them to consume the entire race of Necrontier, which raises the question if this was simply a manipulation to ensure the Necrontier provided them with the souls they hungered for so desperately. Despite the reprieve though, the old ones were by now absolutely desperate. The writing was on the wall and they needed a means by which to try and turn things to their favour, yet time was not on their side, and even as they placed their hopes with their creations that they might be their salvation, the Catan and Necron continued to ravage the galaxy seemingly blissfully distracted. Considering the old ones now nothing more than a minor irritation, it could be easily dealt with at their convenience. Before the old ones had ceded life for the sake of peaceful creation, now they did so with an urgent and necessary purpose. They ceded many new life forms, but the most important of these would be the Eldar, or the Eldari. It's believed they also created the Orcs, now known here as the Krok, and details of these are almost non-existent. There's really no reference to their involvement within the period of the War in Heaven, however, some references have pointed toward the so-called Krok from this time being apparently more clear-minded. It's debatable whether modern Orcs, when talking regarding their ancestors they speak of the Brain Boys, were in fact the Old Ones themselves, or were these more clear-minded iterations of themselves. Regardless, despite the ongoing war in heaven, the Eldar would grow as a race over millennia, and because of the continual threats and disruption occurring, they did so now without the guidance of the Old Ones, who had returned to continue fighting the war in heaven. These early Eldar were learning about the nature of the warp in this time, and they would reach into the Immaterium, and very importantly, it appears that the warp in this time was far more accessible, overlapping with reality, not separated as it is today, and also that the warp appeared to be considerably more calm, even safe, for them to manipulate. For the Eldar, their natural-born psychic talents enabled them to play and experiment with the warp. They used it in crafting their works and their culture, all of which were glorious. But these peaceful times would not last. The Old Ones returned from the darkness beyond the sky. Their strange and vast vessels were scarred and worn. Their presence dimmed from what the Eldar remembered. The Old Ones had returned to inspect their creations, and on discovering their warp experimentations, they encouraged the Eldar to reach further into the Immaterium to discover newfound creativity. Creativity for weapons of war. This period we refer to as the War in Heaven, and the role to which those within it, such as the Eldar, are unsurprisingly so ancient that descriptions are fractured, contradictory, and many of the records are basically cultural tales of Eldar mythology, and little more. So, even with the best and most conscientious documenting and rationalization, it still leaves us far from any concrete conclusions. Although, if you want to hear my extended thoughts, revisit part two of this series, where I dive deeper into the Eldar mythology and their gods. And this is something we will revisit as well in upcoming episodes. But it's important to remember that most of this takes place anything like 60 million years before the current age of the Imperium, and that even for the Eldar, the truth of these times is very clouded. What this means for us is that sometimes even when there appears to be a clear reference to something, it cannot be trusted and very well may have meant to originally reference something else entirely. So any and all references from this age should be viewed with high scepticism. I'll restate for clarity that most of our descriptions from this time are again very clouded or deliberately allegorical, and so should not be taken at face value, that is to say taken literally. Most might presume that if you were to say, take for example the Eldar gods, just going by their descriptions, you might well assume that they were sentient walking entities who were more like powerful leaders akin to the Primarchs or even the Emperor. On reflection, this actually seems very unlikely, and that they're more like a folktale or something of an allegory, a story with an alternative or hidden meaning, perhaps a moral, political, or simply an emotionally described history lesson for future generations. The very simplistic, literal interpretation of Eldar gods is that there are these powerful, semi-sentient psychic weapons created by or for the Eldar. Because this is referenced, it fits very well within the intentions of the Old Ones. Now again, we shouldn't entirely dismiss it because part of it is still plausible, especially remembering that when the Old Ones came to creating the newer races like the Eldar, the Krok, they were desperate, they were backed into a corner. 
the Catan and the Necron were decimating them, and the old ones, powerful as they were, were apparently nowhere near as powerful with manipulating and using the warp as their soon-to-blossom creations, the Eldar. It seems to me that the old ones gambled that the Eldar would be their salvation, and they had achieved either accidentally or deliberately in creating a race that had truly immense psychic power and sensitivity within the warp. Not to mention, their souls had extremely unusual properties and they were able to be continually reborn from the warp itself. It's meant that the Eldar were able to exist seemingly in a state of something like immortality, but again, just how specifically this was manifested is not entirely clear. But it did mean they were heading for another stage in the war in heaven, that of an apocalyptic war of attrition against the Necron and Catan. We have nowhere near enough knowledge to know just how competent the old ones were when it comes to creating life. We can't know if they basically just got very lucky and were seeding planets almost at random, or did they possess the advanced knowledge to be able to craft specifically the life forms they wanted. At the very least, I would guess they had a level of competency in genetic manipulation. The old ones in their desperation encouraged the Eldar to develop their emergent warp skills and to do so as fast as possible, and this is where things become even more unclear. It's possible that by working closely with the Eldar, some of the old ones who had more of an affinity with them came to be viewed as gods, or that the Eldar created entities that were beyond their comprehension during this time. They were, after all, experimenting with raw material in the warp dimension, and were forging entities on experimental instinct rather than learned experience and knowledge, with perhaps little, if any, guidance. And so, it's also a possibility that they perceived them not as their own creations, but as gods who had sprung forth from the warp to aid them. I think of the Eldar in this time being something akin to children in Akira, where they have learned to tap into their powers they were previously unaware of, but for some of them this proved to be extraordinarily dangerous, far beyond even their own comprehension or that of their creators, and this seems to be similarly the case with the Old Ones and the Eldar. Alternatively, maybe the Eldar collectively and unintentionally had created sentient beings with godlike qualities, perhaps from their own dreams, their mirrored reflective extensions of themselves, a foreshadowing of what would be later to come from humanity. I especially like this concept myself, that rather than simply playing with the raw warp, the Eldar completely unintentionally created their own gods out of the Immaterium, perhaps waking up one day to find these figures among them and took them as being their pantheon. We know that the warp reflects the thoughts and collective feelings of mortal and psychically sensitive creatures, and remembering that question people are always asking, the question about why are there no good or positive gods in the warp. While the warp in the current time of the 41st millennium, the age of the Imperium, we see how the galaxy itself is such a hellscape that if it were even possible for anything positive to be born into the warp, it's such a literal nightmare dimension it is presumed that any good creations would be immediately smothered, consumed or worse, before it really even knew what was what. We may assume ending up being then tortured for eternity by Slanesh or experimented upon by Nurgle. The warp during the early times of the galaxy and the war in heaven was seemingly a very different place than now. It was not a nightmarish hellscape, but instead a peaceful and serene sea of neutrality, a beautiful sea of psychic energy. How do we know this? Well, for one, by logical assumption, the other being relative descriptions by both Eldar and indeed also humans. The Eldar were essentially able to bathe in the warp during this time. There are no descriptions in Eldar mythology during the beginning of their race of horrors consuming them, nor did they fear for their souls as the modern Eldar do for well-established reasons. There's nothing to suggest otherwise that I've seen. The only descriptions of any dangers or predators in the warp come much later toward the end of the war in heaven but not at all during this early period, or even throughout the Eldar's establishment during the War in Heaven. Their gods, such as Azurian, Isha, and Vol, who were all constructive entities, but the Eldar simultaneously brought forth those like Cain, god of war and destruction. Except Cain was not a being constructed from the darkest of dark desires. He was brought forth as a more positive still representation of the Eldar's need to express and feel the need for violence and war. That's not necessarily as negative as it sounds. Like most mortal creatures, it could be construed as something more akin to a need for self-preservation. We know this well to be an extremely powerful base instinct, one expressed by 
all mortal creatures when most needed, so within the idea of them creating Eldar gods perhaps unintentionally or at a more subconscious level, it seems feasible. As I say, there is of course plenty of room for overlapping speculation here. If you want to know more of the mythology, which is highly relevant, then revisit part two. Ultimately, it is possible that some of the entities referred to as Eldar gods could have been or were at one time old ones. Yes, it's possible. Or it may even be more confusing than that. Perhaps they were old ones initially, but as the Eldar shifted their perceptions, these figureheads were simply amalgamated and reassigned. They may have begun as old ones and their representations moved sideways as creations of the Eldar or even simply tales told within Eldar culture. The only thing that does seem sure is that it feels unlikely we will ever know any of the true specifics of these matters, although it has been hinted at in some of the newer material. Having by now suffered terrible devastation from the initial conflict against the Catan and Necron, the Old Ones were severely diminished. It is said that consequently upon their return, their influence with the burgeoning race of the Eldar we know was dwindling. It seems reasonable that the Eldar's well-known arrogance was, if not emerging, then already demonstrating itself to be a defining trait even in these earliest of days. The Eldar, having experienced little of the galaxy, were perhaps overconfident in their abilities and would ignore pleas from their former mentors, the Old Ones. It's possible, of course, that the Old Ones themselves, in a precarious position, were willing to just allow the Eldar to power on and use whatever means they thought necessary to turn the tide. And the Eldar would begin to call forth their warp creations. Unimaginable, sentient weapons, which through their descriptions appear to have been powered by not just Eldar psychic ability, but potentially even by a means of detaching their souls a strange trait of the Eldar that we'll discuss again further in the future. Perhaps they were invoking the forces of their spirits in the form of the god Cain. These Eldar entities, material or otherwise, are the first true gods of the Immaterium. Not chaos gods to be clear, but just godlike entities of immense power whose origins appear to have been the warp. The Eldar, we may assume, were still being somewhat guided by the last survivors of their ancient creators and would in time rise to galactic dominance. They would use the bright paths of the webway to strike far and wide, unleashing without restraint the power of their psychic might against the physically trapped Necron, often still referred to the Eldar in their history as Necron Tear. Their psychic warp fueled powers sent the Catan and Necron reeling. These powers were an anathema to them. These powerful psychers were something that they had never anticipated. Whether the Old Ones were directly in command or not at this point is seemingly irrelevant. The Catan and Necron were facing now a powerful force who were fighting back and dealing significant damage in the process. No matter what destruction they attempted to unleash upon the galaxy, the Catan and Necron could not slow or contain the Old Ones and their Eldari's relentless advance. The tables had turned and this now forced the Catan, who had been disengaged for millions of years not fighting in any real collective sense, to pay attention. Their dominance had led them to become complacent and turned again, simply feeding off what fruits the galaxy had to offer. The shocking emergence of the Eldar forced them to once again unify, push back against the Old Ones and fight these new magicking allies. But yet again, as we continue further down the rabbit hole, this is where things do become considerably more vague. According to the Necron, this led to the Catan beginning what would be the eventual creation of their greatest work, to permanently seal off the material realm from the Immaterium, thus trapping the Eldar's warp creations and greatly diminishing their power. This suggests to us, as I've stated, originally the warp and reality overlapped and bled together in a much more undefined way than now, as if the sea of the warp was lapping against the shores of reality. That the Eldar's powerful warp creations, their living weapons, could walk in and out of it, and generally use it to further their own needs at will. Essentially what we're considering here is the Great Rift, which is now one of the greatest threats to the galaxy in the 41st millennium. But this was already potentially a thing in the past, and like a wound that had never truly healed, has now once again been torn open. This is my speculation, I should say. If we assume this, then it seems logical that it was the purpose for the black pylons the Necron had created in these ancient times, to seal the Eldar from the warp and simultaneously create gigantic null fields like the Pariah Nexus, 
to prevent the Eldar from using their immensely powerful weapons. Through the combined power of the Necron and Catan, they would end this threat of the Eldar god weapons and permanently separate the two realities. Now I prefer this version of events as it aligns more with what we know is happening now in the galaxy and it ties together many loose ends but we can never know for sure unless more information is revealed through first hand accounts of Necron and Eldar or some device or some device or ancient ruins that help to reveal more about these times. It's notable also that this is based on the Necron version of events. History, as we know, rarely has just one side to it. So according to Eldar legends, it was Azurian, inspired by Isha, who separated the Materium from the Immaterium permanently. It is said that Isha, the Eldar god of life, healing, fertility and growth, who is seen as being the mother of the Eldar, had wept at the destruction being caused by the war god Cain, who was reaping his lust for blood, even upon his own kind, believing them to be the source of his future destruction. The Zurian felt it was necessary to permanently separate the warp from mortal reality. Isha and Kurnos would go to Vol, the smith god of artisans and psychic craft, to fashion from the tears of Isha what are now believed by the Eldar to be their spirit stones. Isha wanted to gift these to her children, the Eldar, to enable them to communicate with their gods in the warp across this barrier of separation erected by Azurian. Azurian, though, had wanted to complete a separation from the mortal realm, believing it to be fundamentally dangerous as borne out by the wanton slaughter of Cain. It is said that in his rage he would throw Isha and Kurnos to the blood god Cain, who would relish in torturing those of his kind who had prevented him from carrying out his relentless path of rage and slaughter upon the Eldar, because he believed this would be the nature of his destruction. Vol was able to learn of their miserable fate and felt this was too disturbing a situation within the pantheon of Eldar gods to be allowed to continue. He would strike a bargain with Cain to craft for him 100 swords, known as the Blades of Vol. In exchange for these powerful weapons, Cain should release Isha and Kurnos from captivity. Vol worked without rest upon the blades until he was left but one in order to complete his promise to Cain. And this is where things got very interesting in terms of the relationship between the gods and actually how things play out in terms of the actual history between the Necron, the Eldar and the War in Heaven. Now toward the end of Dark Origins Part 2 I described a long excerpt that highlights this contradictory account to the Eldar mythology where it describes the god Cain fighting the Catan, albeit by another name, and their hordes of silver undead. It also describes how the way of reincarnation was closed to the Eldar here forever. Like much of the folklore and tales of these times, it overlaps with other accounts and contradicts those which describe how it was with the Necron themselves who were responsible for the destruction of the Nightbringer Catan. And this is the problem of the period known as the War in Heaven because so much of it seems to be interpreted differently. The Eldar, we assume, lost their ability to be reborn during the fall and creation of Slanesh, but if we trust this version of events, it actually happened millions of years earlier a troubling but not unusual conflict of a significant detail. And the detail here was that Vol had deliberately made one of these blades weaker, so that Cain, when he was fighting the Catan, eventually was able to be damaged and broken by them. In trying to make sense of Eldar mythology, we are left to largely infer and read between the lines, and thankfully there are also more recent references to this time, notably via Rise of Aeneid. When we're thinking about time and the presence and the block of the universe and how this all fits together, one quotation comes to mind where a modern Eldar in the 41st millennium is having visions and feeling confused about past memories that they have. He thought about the endless lives he had lived, lives he did not recall but could still feel in his immortal soul and of the great cycles of the universe. How many wars in heaven have there been, he asked, struck by the sudden thought. Necrontir and Eldari created these vaults together. Did all of this happen before? There is often this sense that the war in heaven refers collectively to the whole period of these early times, as it was a period of unending war. Perhaps so much time had passed and things became so unclear that it was just easier to refer to the whole period as one war, the war in heaven. Now I want to note again, this is where perception of time is so relevant. The war in heaven is often described as having taken place over not hundreds or thousands, but millions of years. 
involving destructions of entire races and planets and stars and systems themselves, for us to try and comprehend this is really beyond our experience. So maybe no surprise then as to why these descriptions about the Eldar and the Necron and the mythology are so vague and become interlinked and crisscrossed throughout the dense fog of time. I often have seen people appearing confused as to why the war between the Old Ones and the Necron tier, the Old Ones, Catan, Necron, Eldar, are all referred to as the War in Heaven. And this is exactly why. It seems that there were other equally disastrous conflicts in this time also, which are less well remembered, but still sit under the banner overall of the War in Heaven, the umbrella of the War in Heaven. Now, I've long speculated that despite it not being explicitly stated, there are many markers, red flags within the mythology of the Eldar that point to some form of huge factional civil war during this period defined as the War in Heaven. And this could have been the result of any number of internal disagreements over the vast amount of time we're considering. It could have happened many times even. The speculative origins of this could be numerous. Perhaps some Eldar felt that they must honour and stand with the Old Ones, while others felt this was not even their war to fight. Later, such practical reasons could have been exaggerated into the grand mythological tales. Regardless, it's doubtful if the truth will ever be known regarding Eldar mythology, but it does seem that something significant occurred outside of the more prominent, established war between the Old Ones, Eldar, Catan and Necron. At the end of all of this though, things would finally come to something of a conclusion. The Old Ones would seemingly disappear, retreating back into their webway, where it is said they knew they could be relatively safe from the ravaging forces of the Catan and the Necron, thus leaving the Eldar to fend for themselves against the cold metallic shells of emotionless drone soldiers and their godlike masters. The Eldar had become a power in their own right. They wielded warp power and even created entities as weapons against the Catan. It is spoken to that end that the boundaries between their gods of the warp and the gods of the stars had blurred, and the Eldar could not tell one from another. This is suggestive that initially, again, the Eldar had full control over their warp creations, but as the war continued and became ever more devastating, this resonated, as we know it to, in the warp, and that entities which were originally obedient to the Eldar's command became just as hostile as the enemy they were facing. And again, it's not explicitly stated, that is my inference. But along with this, we know some of their own gods like Cain seemingly had at some point at least partially turned against them after having prophetic dreams. Potentially also suggests that it is to the surprise of no one, the Eldar who initially disturbed the warp. We have no way to know for sure how much emotional energy had poured into the warp at this time, especially remembering that Catan themselves consumed a significant amount of souls from the worlds across the galaxy, and that this could account for the argument that perhaps despite the vast war in heaven, that not enough spiritual energy was provided to create the true birth of what we know as the Chaos Gods. So what I'm saying here is that people always refer to the war in heaven as being so apocalyptic that it must have been the cause of the Chaos Gods because surely something so destructive would have poured pain and suffering into the warp on an unimaginable scale. And I wouldn't presume to dismiss that rationale out of hand, but I would say that the relationship between what we would define as a soul and our emotions and dreams and so on feeding and shaping the warp is hardly defined with scientific precision. We don't know how those two things relate together. We know, of course, that later the Eldar would end up creating Slanesh, but perhaps there were also a lot of other things going on there. It could well be that although there was much emotional trauma at this time, maybe that in and of itself was not enough to form the entities completely that we consider chaos gods. Perhaps it brought them into a very early unconscious state of being, but they were not fully born into this time. We know that when people die, they were said to return to the warp. Ancient human shamans were aware of this and their ability to use the warp. However, consider if you will, that there seems to be a definite relationship of creatures which are partly psychic and the warp, and that those with psychic presences influence the warp more and certainly feed into it more. This is one of the reasons why humanity has become so important for chaos gods in the 41st millennium. You have a specific species 
that contains trillions of souls, all easily twisted and manipulated and regenerating all the time with raging emotions and dreams, pouring like an endless, powerful cascade into the warp. The Eldar were not like humanity, they were far more controlling of their minds. The Necron had no emotion after their biotransference and the war in heaven began. The Catan consumed the souls and all those sentient beings that they had exterminated. So it's questionable how much emotional and psychic material actually poured into the warp during this time, despite the fact that it was a very apocalyptic period. For example, if we consider a race like the Orc, the Tyranid, the Tau, how much do they contribute to the warp? Orcs have a very strange relationship with the Immaterium already, and the Tau are said to not contain any real psychers. Their lives are highly disciplined as well. They're not chaotic and emotionally consuming like humanity. The Tyranids, instinctive killing machines, but also have crazy powerful psychic powers. But again, very different than humanity. My point is that it's not as simple as just saying big war equals must be source of chaos gods. But again, we'll, we'll get into this later. What I feel confident to say though, is that the Eldar's actions absolutely caused an initial disturbance within the warp. And so if you wanted to say anything specific, I feel that you could say that this period does set off a chain of causal events, which point to the fact that they likely begin a process which would, unbeknownst to them, eventually lead to their near total destruction and the fall of their race, far in the future from this point in time. Much of this is described via the Liber Chaotica as well, which is considered by many to be an irrelevant, unreliable and overly imaginative text, especially given it's an account derived from one mad person relaying insane dreams and visions. However, consider this as a source we must, because information from these times is so scarce, and the Liber does describe with detail specific events and depictions that appear nowhere else. In the dark, unspecified final period of the war in heaven, the Necrons were apparently able to finally gain access to the Old One's webway, and it was here they would meet out their vengeance of having been denied their secrets of immortality so long ago by the Old Ones. They achieved this through a series of living stone portals known as the Dolmen Gates. The Necrons were able to turn the Old Ones' greatest weapon against them, vastly accelerating the ultimate end of the war in heaven. Curiously, the portals offered by the Dolmen Gates are neither stable nor so controllable as those used by the Eldari and the Jakari. It's even said that by some unknown methodology, the webway can detect when its space has been breached by a Dolmen Gate and its arcane mechanisms will attempt to seal off the infected spur from the rest of the dimension until the danger to its integrity has passed. This unknown technology seems certainly by design of the Old Ones to prevent lesser races breaching their webway dimension, and so Necrons entering the webway must reach their intended destination through its shifting extra-dimensional corridors quickly, lest the network itself bring about their destruction. Of course, in the present age, eons have passed since the Necrons used the Dolmen Gates to assault their enemies. The Old Ones are gone, and the webway itself has now become a tangled and broken labyrinth. Most Dolmen Gates were lost or abandoned during the time of the Necron's Great Sleep, which came at the end of the War in Heaven, and many more were deliberately destroyed by the Eldar. Those that remain grant access to but a small portion of the webway, and of that much has been sealed by the Eldar. Yet, the webway is vast, and even these limited sections enable the Necron a mode of travel that far outpaces other younger races. For the Necron, without access to the webway, they would be forced to rely once again on slow voyaging stasis ships, dooming them to effectively galactic isolation. The highly questionable Liber Chaotica speaks of how the Necron suffered by means of demonic incursions from the warp, and that it was the Eldar who had the knowledge of how to seal the rift between the warp and material space and that their gods would remain there also. And this is connected to Eldar mythology again, speaking of their pantheon of gods being separated from walking among them. However, as noted before, the Necrons had equal reason for wanting to seal the warp and limit the Eldar from using potentially their world-ending psychic weapons and engines of war. But there is also talk of later an enslaver plague from the warp. We know the enslavers, we know that strange entities are said to have appeared and to have affected this early period of the galaxy. 
And this could additionally also connect with the reason as to why the Necrons built again those Blackstone pylons. However, perhaps in actuality, it was not a case of one faction or another sealing the warp. There is in fact a third possibility of these strange warp entities beginning to appear and that perhaps they were so aggressive and so unusual. This created a situation where both sides had fair reason for not just wanting to seal the warp, but to work together to this end. The Necron Silent King had long realized the error he made in allowing the Catan to twist his race into the emotionless living metal zombies that they now were, all that remained of the Necron tier. The Catan had devoured their souls and all that they were, and so in the final ending times of the war in heaven, it is said that the Catan, having gorged on whatever remained of the old ones, were not expecting a vicious rebellion from the Necron. Information to this end is again scarce, but it said how the Necron turned their unimaginably powerful weapons against the Catan and then that they shattered them. The Catan being made of the actuality of the universe itself, there's no way for them to be completely destroyed, but they were shattered and many locked away in the Tesserae extra dimensional vaults of the Necron. And these are said to be one of the sources of their great power even now, and that they could provide the Necron with enough energy to allow them to outsit eternity. In fact, by some accounts, this was one of their original reasons for entering their great slumber at the end of the war in heaven. Why bother fighting our enemy if you can simply wait for all mortal creatures to just die by means of entropy? One Necron spoke to this, saying, through eyes far superior to any organic equivalent, she marvelled at the interplay of molecules distorted and rent apart by the released energy of the god fragment. The thought that she harnessed the energy of this galactic predator brought a glimmer of satisfaction. It was but a small piece of the whole, yet it would burn for eternity, giving off its life force to sustain as it had once sought to feed off the lives of her people. It would be mistaken to think of the caging of the exostellar manifestation as a punishment for the betrayal of its whole. The far greater reason was pragmatic. When the stars themselves would gutter and die, when entropy had all but quenched life from the galaxy, this being and the others like it would sustain the Necrontier civilization. Truly, they had mastered their destiny. Retribution was fleeting. Dominance was forever. Now as a side note, this also points me to believe that the Eldar had already lost their immortality as their mythology suggests by the end of the war in heaven, not during the creation of Slanesh, as I feel this aligns better with the Necrons' planned slumber. Before this though, and having shattered their star gods, the Catan, it seems probable that after this vast galactic war, both the Necron and the Eldar were not at their most powerful. They likely had both suffered very heavy losses, and I believe that this is another reason as to why they backed off from one another. This had been a truly apocalyptic galactic war. The Elder were fighting after all, as well at the behest of the Old Ones, not for themselves. The Necron were fighting against the Old Ones, but with the Catan now ruling them. So again, not for themselves. Although of course, we should remember still the history of the Necron tier, but it's said that the Catan also wanted to fight the Old Ones. So you could imagine after that goal was completed, the Necrons had no real issue necessarily with the Eldar. The point being, one might suggest that as strange as it might seem, it could have been that the Necron and Eldar ended up with some kind of near-like truce situation at the end of the War in Heaven, both realizing that continue on with fighting served to benefit neither of them. Also, that because of this weakened period after so much war, the emergence of a new threat out of the warp, and not necessarily chaos gods or anything even like that, but there are, like I say, many bizarre entities in the warp, and not just enslavers, but all manner of strange things who are near enough all known to be viciously aggressive. It could have been, and again, my pure speculation, that these were early experiments by the Eldar, perhaps intentional, perhaps not, and yes, they were the earliest forms of malevolent sentient things becoming self-aware in the warp as a result of this horrific war in heaven. But either way, there are several references to the emergence of these kind of entities around this time, and so it is my guesstimation 
that the Eldar and Necron had decided to somehow work together, in actuality to perhaps seal the warp or close off any remaining portals to it. Now that sounds like just my wild speculation, doesn't it? Except there is a reference which points to this in fairly current material. A group of Eldar encounter a world where a Necron tomb is discovered. They find a strange gateway. Except that this was no Eldar webway portal, nor a dolmen gate. This was an ancient gateway marked with what was said to be the very most ancient Eldar ruins, suggestive by their descriptions of being as old as perhaps the war in heaven, but most troubling is that the gateway also appeared to be marked by Eldar and Necron ruins together. The Eldar are highly confused by this, suggesting this is some event not even recorded or remembered within their current cultural knowledge. How and why would any kind of gateway into the warp or the webway be carved with both Eldar and Necron runes together? It seems to defy all that their cultural history taught, unless of course you consider the highly likely scenario that to the surprise of nobody, both the Eldar and Necron ancient history is incredibly biased, and that perhaps in this time they realised it was actually for the betterment of all that they seal off this stirring darkness within the warp, and for a brief time, bizarrely, they entered into some pact to combine efforts to close the greater threat, which was now the disturbed sea of the Immaterium, for within its ever more turbulent waters lurked dark, dark horrors. And to that end, far worse, of course, was still to come for the Eldar.